The Songhai Empire was one of the largest empires in West Africa. It was founded in 1464 and lasted for 127 years until 1591, when it was conquered by the Moroccan army. The empire was known for its wealth, trade, and military power. The fall of the Songhai Empire was due to a combination of factors, including internal conflicts, external pressures from neighbors, and most surprisingly, a full frontal assault by Hathor, cow goddess of Egypt, and her bovines of destruction. Well, maybe not an Egyptian god, but cows would play a hand in leading to this once great empire's downfall. We go over all of this and more in this historical quarrel. So to start today's episode, let's go ahead and introduce ourselves to the main players in this story, which is the the Songhai Empire and the Moroccan, um, I guess, city-state, or you could also call it an empire at the time. Uh, The Songhai Empire, which emerged as a significant power in West Africa between the 15th and 16th centuries, had humble beginnings. Its origins can be traced back to the 7th and 8th centuries, when the Songhai people established the city of Gao along the Niger River. Gao eventually became the capital of the empire and a crucial center of trade and culture. The rise of it is mainly in thanks to the collapse of the Mali Empire. The decline of the neighboring Mali Empire in the 14th century provided an opportunity for the Songhai people to assert their independence and expand their territories. The weakening of Mali's power created a power vacuum in the region that the Songhai were able to capitalize on and retake control of their capital city, Gao. They were mainly able to do this thanks to the leadership of Sunni Ali. The Songhai Empire reached its zenith under the rule of Sunni Ali, who reigned from 1464 to 1492. Sunni Ali was a skilled military leader and a strategist who significantly expanded the empire's territories through a series of successful military campaigns. Under his leadership, the empire captured important cities such as Timbuktu and Jeni, which became vital trade and cultural centers. The control over these trade routes gave the Sungai Empire a strategic location along the Niger River, which allowed it to control the very important trans-Saharan trade routes that connected West Africa with North Africa and the Mediterranean, essentially turning themselves into the Mali Empire II electric boogaloo. But they all hated the idea of a sequel, and they thought they should just reboot the Empire series, which is what J.J. Abrams and Disney would later do to Star Wars, where they tried to essentially reboot it, but decided to call it a sequel instead because, but at the same time, they just tried to repeat the entire first film and try to copy all the good parts, but they just did it worse? Despite having an extra 40 years of technology, technological advancement and cultural dip advancement and way more money to spend, they still couldn't compare to the OG and they fucked it up. Sorry. What I'm trying to say is that the Songhai Empire was just the Mali Empire in terms of how it gained power uh, as these trade routes were vital for the exchange of goods, including gold, salt, ivory, and slaves. The empire's control over these routes enabled it to generate considerable wealth and develop a strong economy. The Songhai Empire also had an efficient system of administration and governance that allowed it to effectively manage its vast territories. The empire was divided into provinces, which were overseen by appointed governors. This system of governance helped maintain stability and control uh, control across the diverse and expansive empire, which is something that Disney also tried with Star Wars franchise, by dividing out its properties to different directors and writers with varying levels of skill and talent, leading to some parts being managed, and you also get episode 9 with some others. Or 8. Or just most of it, besides The Mandalorian. And even The Mandalorian had shitty episodes too. I'm gonna keep going. The Songhai Empire also had intellectual and cultural centers. These renowned intellectual and cultural centers, such as Timbuktu and Jenny, housed 
prestigious Islamic universities and libraries, attracting scholars, artists, and traders from across the Islamic world. Also similar to Disney, as they own many intellectual and cultural centers as well, such as Disney University, ESPN, ABC, Disney World, and arguably their most important cultural influence in America uh, with the History Channel's Swamp People. The Empire's reputation as a center of learning and culture contributed to its prestige and influence. In summary, the rise of the Sungai Empire to its impressive heights can be attributed to the decline of the Mali Empire, strong leadership of under Sunni Ali, control over lucrative trade routes, efficient administration, and the development of intellectual and cultural centers. Much like how the rise of the Disney Empire can be attributed to the fall of Lafagram Studios, the strong leadership of Walt Disney, control over lucrative film and other copyrights, efficient administration, and the development of many of their LLCs and stock portfolio. I, I, I promise you that is not the end of the comparisons. It keeps going. And even though it keeps going, this does lead us into the Moroccan Empire and its origins. Morocco is a country located in the northwest corner of Africa with a rich and diverse history that spans thousands of years. A strategic location along the Atlantic Ocean and the, Mered and the Med Mediterranean Sea, as well as its proximity to Europe, has made Morocco an important hub for trade, culture, and interaction between various civilizations. The origins and rise of Mar uh, Morocco can be attributed to several factors, such as the indigenous Berber people that had inhabited the region that is now Morocco for thousands of years. They established various kingdoms and tribal confederations throughout the region, with the first significant Berber state being the kingdom of Marutania, which emerged around the 3rd century BCE, who would then be later conquered by a bunch of assholes like the Romans and Byz uh, Byzantine people and get their shit stolen from them, much like how America, Spain, France, really England conquered a bunch of indigenous people who had established various kingdoms and tribal confederations and had their shit stole stolen by a bunch of random assholes they had just met. Very similar kind of origins here. Between the 1st and 7th century CE, the region was under the control of the Roman Empire, and later the Byzantine, uh, Byzantine Empire. Roman and Byzantine control contributed to the development of urban centers, infrastructure, and trade networks in the region, very similar to how European rule contributed to the development in the Americas. In the 7th century, Arab Islamic forces conquered the region, introducing Islam and the Arabic language to the Berber people. This conquest led to the formation of various Islamic Berber dynasties, such as the Idrisid dynasty in the late 8th century and early 9th centuries, which is often considered the first Moroccan state. Morocco had reached new heights during the Almoravid and Almohad in the 12th and 13th century, well, 11th and 12th and then 12th and 13th, respectively, with their dynasties. These Berber Islamic dynasties expanded their territories, conquering parts of the Iberian Peninsula, present-day Spain and Portugal, and other regions in North Africa. Their rule saw improvements in infrastructure, trade, and the flourishing of arts and culture. Following the decline of the Almohad da uh, dynasty, the Merinid, 13th to the 15th centuries, and Watasid, 15th to the 16th century dynasties emerged. While these dynasties struggled to maintain the territorial extent of their predecessors, they continued to develop urban centers like Fez and Marrakesh, promoting trade and supporting intellectual pursuits. Much like how Nike would fail to keep their growth of their footwear in the running and boring Olympics market, but would end up finding it much more success in marketing to inner city children through, their, through the deal they made with Michael Jordan, which would lead to the 1996 smash hit film Space Jam. If uh, if I get sued for that, I don't know. I mean, this is pretty small small podcast. I don't. I hope I'm not gonna get sued, but totally worth it. Anyways, <laughs> the uh, Saudi dynasty in the 16th and 17th centuries brought a period of stability and prosperity to Morocco, 
They succeeded in unifying the country and repelling both Ottoman and Portuguese invasions. Under their rule, Morocco expanded its control over the Trans-Saharan trade routes and eventually reached into the Sungai Empire, which is where our story really begins. In summary, the rise and development of Morocco can be attributed to its Berber origins, Roman and uh, Byzantine influence, Arab Islamic conquest, various Berber Islamic dynasties, and the current Alouite monarchy. Its strategic location and control over trade routes have, made, have also played a significant role in its historical development and prominence. To fully understand this quarrel today, we need to understand another separate quarrel that Morocco was involved in before the start of our main beef between them. And then the song uh, between them and the Songhai Empire, much like how the feud of Ron DeSantis and Disney slash LGBTQI plus people can be traced back to the feud between Ron DeSantis and his own sexuality and his sick BDSM fantasies he has with Jesus. Similarly, we can trace back the reason why Morocco decided to invade the Songhai Empire, being its wars with the Iberian powers of Portugal and Spain. The conflicts between Morocco and the Iberian powers of Portugal and Spain were primarily driven by the competition for control over trade routes and territorial expansion, as well as the religious tensions between Christian Europe and the Muslim world during the period of the Reconquista and the ensuing Age of Discovery, which was pretty much the medieval equivalent of the age of counterculture the world experienced in the 1960s, where instead of you know, exploring new drugs and crazy sexual experience. It was entire countries that discovered and explored new drugs, crazy sexual experiences, and mapped out a bunch of shit and named people something different than what they actually called themselves. That's, uh, that was pretty much the age of discovery. So anyways, due to all the, ex- all of this exploration, Portugal had become an emerging maritime power in the 15th century who sought to expand its influence by establishing a series of trading posts along the African coast. This expansion brought them into direct conflict with Morocco, which had control over many of these regions. The Battle of Quetta in 1415, where the Portuguese captured the Moroccan city of Quetta, marks the beginning of these conflicts. This was followed by a series of battles and sieges as Portugal attempted to extend its control over more cities along the Moroccan coast such as the Casar es Seguir, uh, Asila, and Tangier. The Portuguese were interested in these locations due to, due to their strategic position for trade and for launching exploration voyages around Africa. Spain, like Portugal, also sought to expand its influence into North Africa. The conflicts between Spain and Morocco were tied to the Re- uh, Reconquista, the Christian effort to retake the Iberian Peninsula from Muslim rule because Jesus really wanted that expensive new all silk robe and didn't want to be paying on the transportation costs uh, for those goods. And so therefore commanded that Granada get taken and his holy balls get caressed by the smoothest of fabrics known to man. Thus saith the Lord. And so concluded the fall of Granada in 1492. And Jesus did get that fancy, silky robe that he had been wanting. And so he blessed Spain by letting them find this continent named America instead of India, and then in them fuck over the people there for centuries. After the Reconquista, Spain, now a unified Catholic kingdom, continued its campaign against Islam by targeting the Muslim states in North Africa. Spain captured several enclaves, on the Moroccan coast, such as uh, Melilla and the Peñón de Vélez de la Gomera. These territories were of strategic importance as they controlled access to the Mediterranean Sea. And the conflicts would eventually lead Morocco to have taken heavy losses and a need of funds to resupply themselves and fund their, their armies and need to line their own pockets. So when Sultan al-Mansur saw a supple, sweet, young empire with mm, so much juicy gold and salt trades, he couldn't help himself. I decided to take over the once great empire. 
mm, all that juicy gold. Mm. Uh, that's what I imagine he was saying. However, that's ne neither here nor there quite yet. Let's take a look into the inner workings of the Songhai Empire and its timeline of events that would lead to its collapse. As mentioned before, uh, in 1464, we have the official start of the Songhai Empire, with Sunni Ali being marked as its first true emperor. Though it is worth noting, he was actually the 15th ruler of the Sunni dynasty, who did rule over the Songhai people, but it was Sunni Ali who took it from a small kingdom to the empire it became. During the collapse of the Mali Empire, Sunni Ali was able to capture many cities and fortify them, such as Timbuktu in 1468 and Jene in 1475. It was noted that he was regarded as a tyrant and would slaughter all those that opposed him and impose strict, strict religious rules. By the time of his death in November, uh, November 6th, 1492, the Songhai Empire had begun to surpass the heights of the Mali Empire and engulfed what was remaining of their land. Sunni Ali's death is greatly contested as to how it happened. Some scholars believe he simply had a heart attack or another illness that took him out while he slept. There are some that believe he died in, uh, in a battle. And a fringe theory, again, very fringe theory that suggests um, he would offer up non-Muslim babies as sacrifices and suckled the sweet adrenochrome out of their spines and never truly died. Rather, he went on to live forever and even had a pigmentation surgery done and then got into making small animation cartoons, uh, his most popular being one of a mouse that he nicknamed Mickey, and then he became a ruthless tyrant of the American corporate world, slowly but surely rebuilding his empire, but this time solely through the power of money, and money alone, doing what he wished he was able to do with his first empire, but this time succeeding, and has been secretly ruling the Disney nation from the shadows, still suckling on the adrenochrome of children that die at his parks. Or maybe none of that happened. <laughs> and that's just a fucking crazy theory that no one has ever said before. And, you know, I'm just a fucking crazy person. So take that for what it is. The actual truth, according to the uh, Tariq al Sudanis, is that he drowned crossing the Niger River. Uh, or, according to oral tradition, he was killed by his nephew, Sia Muhammad Ture. Uh, Ture. But, you know, that's a, a lot less fun to think about than immortal Walt Disney Ali <laughs> being the puppet master of a Disney corporate machine. Uh, anyways, after his uh, death, his son, Sonny Baru, ascended to the throne, but was pretty much immediately challenged by his possible traitor cousin, who may or may not have killed Ali. So, again, back on November 6, 1492, while Christopher Columbus was lost as fuck somewhere near the uh, Bahamian Islands, likely San Salvador, and fucking the locals, the natives, because, you know, that's what assholes do. Sonny Baru took the throne of the Great Songhai Empire and started the Civil War with his, possib possibly Dijin, his possible Jin traitor cousin, Sia Muhammad. Now, you might be asking yourself, why would the nephew of the emperor, who was also his general, decide to possibly kill the emperor and then take the throne from his cousin? I know many of you might say, well, obviously he wanted to be the one in charge. And while that may have played some part in his decision making, it was not the main factor. Surprisingly, the main reason stated in the Tarkia Sudari is that Asiya thought his cousin didn't have a big enough dick to rule. According to oral tradition, it was stated that to be a true king and leader of Islam and Muslims, you are supposed to have a shaft measuring from the base of the balls to the tip of at least eight inches. It was stated that during a night spent with concubines that Ali and Asiya had won uh, from one of the cities they conquered, Asiya for the first time had seen Ali's small 4.5 inch peasant dick and that he was disgusted that a man would lie about the size of his penis. Which, I mean, I mean, like, who would, who would ever do that, right? Like, no one, no one would ever do that. Um, just to lay claim to the throne? That's, that's, 
fucking weird. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyways, this devastated Ali. And so he devised a plan to challenge... Um, uh, uh, this devastated Asiya, and so he devised a plan to challenge Sunni Ali to a sword fight, quote unquote, meaning they would fight naked and only be able to use their shafts as swords to inflict bl- bludgeoning damage to the opponent until one surrendered or died. Um, and when the challenge was accepted, Sia demanded that their sword fight be in public, and Ali's other rich elite members of his court agreed that it should be in public, and thus forced Ali to bear his little peasant dick to everyone, and when he did that, the entire court pointed and laughed at him, and so Ali fled in shame and tried to swim across the Niger River, where he subsequently drowned. This then made uh, Sia suspect that Ali's son more than likely also had a tiny peasant penis, and so he, he immediately challenged his claim to the throne as well by whipping out his massive base-to-tip 10.5-inch shaft, declaring this is what the cock of a king should look like. And pretty much everyone else agreed, and a majority of the elite sided with Sia, Asiya, uh, not daring to challenge him after witnessing such a display. Due to them agreeing, uh, agreeing that they sided with him and Baru's rule, uh, with him, so Baru's rule lasted for maybe three days before he was overtaken by the might and girth that Asiya commanded. Um... I really hope that someone for a second there actually thought that that was, uh, that's totally what went down and just thought, huh, weird, but okay, I guess it was just different times. <laughs> um, if you did, please, please let me know. I, I, I kind of doubt it. Um, I'm not too good at these fake outs yet. I, I'm trying to get better at it. So give me, give me some time. Actually, um, so Asiya would just claim that Baru was not a faithful Muslim and Asiya was a very devout Muslim. And when I say devout, I mean this guy probably had the entire Quran memorized. The, and the best part is, for the standards back then, and even now really, he wasn't a fanatic and didn't like seeing his faith be used just for political game, which is how many people view Sunni Ali used it, uh, as in Sunni was just a Muslim because that's what everyone else did. And he needed to make sure that people knew he was also Muslim but didn't really adhere to its principles. Meanwhile, Asiya, Muhammad, truly had faith in it and believed in its principles fully. So Asiya called his cousin a shitty Muslim and started gaining allies, which came easily to him as Baru had favored his rural subjects and pissed off the rich people in his court and the urban Muslim population as well. So Asiya used that to build up the army and whipped Baru's peasant dick ass in the Battle of Anfal, April 12th, 1493, where Baru would be deposed and Asiya would end the Sunni dynasty and begin his own dynasty that would last until the end of the Songhai Empire. Thus begins the Asiya dynasty. During Asiya Muhammad's rule, he sought to magnify the importance of Islam in his rule and made the Quran the foundation of the state's civil code. He would even appoint a former Moroccan as an advisor in terms of religious orthodoxy. To go even further, he established Islam as the official religion for the nobles, and in 1496 went on his pilgrimage to Mecca, accompanied by 500 horsemen, 1,000 infantry, and on his way there brought out over 300,000 gold with him and built a place for West Africa pilgrims to stay in Medina and spent so much money in charity that he had accumulated over 50,000 ducats of debt. So once he got back, he got to war and built him back up that war chest. And during that time, he set up efficient administration of the regions conquered by his predecessor, Sunni Ali. He began dividing Songhai into province, uh, provinces and placed each under a governor. A standing army and a fleet of war canoes were organized under the command of a general and an admiral, Moreover, Muhammad created positions of Director of Finance, Justice, Interior, Protocol, Agriculture, Waters, and Forests, and of Tribes of the White Rice, who were the Moors and uh, Turegs, who at the time were vassals of the Sungai and furnished them with squadrons of dromedary-mounted troops. All these officials were, for the most part, chosen from among the nobles and were brothers, sons, or cousins of Muhammad. 
This was a common practice during this time, as you wanted power to remain in your family, so that your name would live on, or some bullshit like that, and uh, they would put them in positions they just 100% were qualified for sometimes, just because they could make sure it was family, and it really decreased the risk of a revolt or a rebellion in their heads, which we'll see later actually doesn't, this doesn't do shit for that. Uh, but it is pretty similar in fashion to how my boss at my old job passed me up for a promotion and instead gave it to his dickhead nephew who never showed up to work on time and would be drunk as well. But he was a good boy. He would never do that or claim my boss. And then I needed to listen to this asshole who didn't know anything about the job other than how to harass female coworkers and probably assaulted one during an office party, I'm pretty sure. But no, 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 he was a good boy who loved his uncle and worked hard for him outside and inside the office. Fucking dick. Uh, you, get, you just gotta love the sweet, blind love that is nepotism. And it's been around forever. So, you know, that's yeah, enough ranting about some asshole I'm pretty sure is in prison. And instead, let's rant about some assholes who are dead, huh? In 1498, uh, Aksia Muhammad had begun his military campaign, which was met with uneven success as he wasn't as skilled at war as his predecessor, Sunni Ali, uh, had been, but still managed to be victorious over Mosi of the Yatenga and the inhabitants, inhabitants of Niger. He would have a significant defeat in 1505 through 06 at the hands of the Borgu, and for the first time, Aksia Big Dick Muhammad had really tasted defeat and realized that you know, he he might not have the biggest dick around anymore. But he quickly rebounded and he was able to stop an insurgency in 1507 and 1514 when the full uh, Fulani fractions tried to rebel against him. So that must have made him feel you know a little bit better. He was probably just thinking, well, it might not be the biggest, but it's still pretty goddamn huge. However, that would be short-lived. Uh, <laughs> it's not even two years later, in 1516. One of his lieutenants, Karta of Karbi, would lead a successful revolt against him and was able to remain independent of the empire afterwards, which, that's pretty big dick energy right there. Despite this, though, he was still able to commit jihad against bordering states and was able to capture and maintain land from Tagaza and its oh-so-lucrative salt mines and its trade routes to Yatenga, in the south, making the empire the biggest it had been since its inception. In addition to expounding the empire and turning it more towards Islam, Asiya was also busy pissing off his sons, who were squabbling over who gets what and who gets who. You know, that's kind of what kids do. <laughs> the only thing is uh, that when these kids squabble, hundreds if not thousands of people die because of their entitlement. This was also due... In, due to, in part, of Asiya Muhammad's dependence on his advisor and close friend, Ali Fulan, who advised Asiya not to give the position of Benga Pharma to his oldest son and instead to his younger son, Bala. And this pissed them all off. So, And his oldest, Musa, was stated to have said, his father does nothing without the approval of Ali Fulan, essentially calling Muhammad a coward. The reliance on Ali was due to Asiya Muhammad becoming blind, and basically he just never told anyone other than Ali to retain some sort of semblance of strength in the eyes of his sons and people, because you know he's he's macho. He's gotta he's gotta make sure that he seems strong and that like no one's gonna fuck with him. Obviously, that didn't work, and the infighting got really fucking bad. It had gotten so bad that after the death of one of Asiya Muhammad's brothers and commander in chief, Kanfari Omar. Muhammad never, no longer felt safe within his own borders, not even within the capital of Gao. And he was stated saying that the Songhai people seemed as crooked as the course of the Niger River, which for context on a map, like from like space, doesn't actually look all that crooked. Honest, honestly, like at all. However, from directly above, like a little, little lower from space, like you, you, you can see it. It has a ton of switchbacks and jagged turns, so I'm talking like back and forth, sharp right turns, just like if that was your spine, you'd be paralyzed. So he, it sounds like his people had really given into corruption and were not loyal to really anything anymore. Um, a large part of this, though, was due to the religious fear that he inspired, 
which eventually led to contempt amongst his children and people. And in 1528, it culminated with his eldest son killing their uncle, Yahya, who was still faithful to Muhammad. He then dispossessed himself of his father, Musa did, and decided to change his name because he was a total edgelord and named himself Asiya Musa. And he didn't like take the last name anymore. The title, the Talisia is just, it's a title. Uh, anyways, he then allowed his father to live in Gao still because while he may hate him, deep down inside, he still loved him. And he was just trying to get daddy's approval. I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe that's why, uh, maybe he just like rubbed it in his dad's face that he usurped power from him. Could be any reason, really. Now, with King Edgelord on the throne, the more, more infighting continued for the next three years, where I hate my dad because he didn't give me a title I wanted, Musa. Uh, his rule was primarily him fighting his brothers and cousins to remain in power. And he did all right, and was able to kill a number of his brothers, uh, and, you know, 25 to 30 of his cousins, which means his KD spread was pretty good. But not good enough, because by 1531, he would be assassinated, and his cousin, Asiya Muhammad Ben Khan, took the throne, who would then banish Asiya Muhammad I to an island within the Nishad River, because he was nervous of a blind old man, I guess, taking over, and would actually be justified in that fear, as you'll see later on. Ben Khan appointed his brother, Uthman Ibn Amar, to the position of uh, Kur Mina Fari. Uh, the Tariq al Sudan contains the description of his court. Asiya Muhammad Bankana furbished the court splendidly, enlarging it, adorning it, and embellishing it with more uh, courtiers, uh, courtiers than ever before. He supplied sumptuous garments, invented different types of musical instruments, versions of the trumpet like uh, uh, forto, uh, Fortifo and deep-sounding Gaptanda drum and sponsored many male and female singers. He gave out abundant largess and benefactions. During his reign, divine favors were bestowed, doors were opened, and blessings poured forth. So it sounds like he, you know, he was, he was a good ruler for the most part. And, uh, but he pissed off the wrong person. <laughs> wrong people as well, because Benkin tried to reverse his uncle's policy of relying on the towns, preferring instead to gather support from the peasants. However, after a series of military favor failures because of this, most notably suffering a terrible defeat at the hands of uh, Muhammadu Karta, the Sarkin of Kebi, who had been who had beaten Muhammad previously, as we mentioned, and again proved his dick was just that much bigger than everyone else. Uh, but never really felt the need to conquer the entirety of an empire. Just, just this little spot. He was like, I'm just good here. My dick's huge, but I just want this. <laughs> so yeah, he whooped his ass. Uh, so Muhammad Benkin was himself deposed in 1537 and was succeeded by Asiya Ismail, son of Asiya al Hajj Muhammad. This was due to the plan that Asiya Muhammad had devised to get himself the fuck out of exile and off that godforsaken island his nephew forced him to. So essentially, Muhammad directed his son Ismail to one of his eunuchs who gave Ismail a shit ton of gold that allowed him to recruit men, allies, and Suma Kutubaki, who was a friend of Benkin and was super down for some betrayal money. Woo! Let's get it. The conspiracy came to fruition when Benkin was encamped at a village called Mansur. Benkin's captains turned against him. He was deposed by the Dendi Fari with the Dendi Fari capturing and chaining up most of Benkin's inner circle. Raised to power by the Dendi Fari, Asiya Ismail was then able to release his father, Asiya Muhammad, from Kangaba Island, bring him home to Gao. For doing this and proving to basically be the only loyal son he had, Muhammad bequeathed his green turban and his caliph saber to him as a gift, which is a great honor. It's a very great honor in uh, that culture. Then a year later, during a time of relative peace, Muhammad the Great died and was buried in Gao in his pyramid-like looking tomb. Like, you should look it up. Just look up um, Asiya Muhammad the First uh, tomb. It's, I don't know, it kind of looks like a pyramid. It's hard to describe. Anyways, 
Then a year later, Ismail campaigned against uh, the one called Bak- uh, Bakabulda in Gurma. Ismail gave charge to the, of the cavalry to Kurmina Fari. Ismail instructed Kurmina Fari to chase and engage Bakabulda and to hold out until Ismail arrived. In the ensuing battle, the Kurmina Fari lost over 900 horsemen. So again, they keep kind of fucking up military campaigns here. However, they succeeded in killing Bakabula and were able to take a large amount of booty, both literal ass and gold. Shortly after this battle, however, in December 1539, Ismail died. After Ismail died, leading, um, leading this, died, the leading decided that it was right for Ishaq, another son of Muhammad the Great, um, to rule and uh, oh boy was that a fucking mistake <laughs> this asshole of a human is regarded as the most ruthless ruler of the Sungai people who caused fear and anxiety for his people <laughs> people I, I'm pretty sure they came up with the word anxiety because of this man let me let me tell you how bad he was his own people wrote this about him in the Tariq al Sudan if he imagined anyone was making the least move against the throne, he would, without exception, have him killed or banished. That was his consistent practice. Did you notice how they use the word consistent? Now, a large part of this, I'm sure, was due to him and his siblings slaughtering the fuck out of each other not even a decade before he took the throne. I'm sure this made him extremely paranoid, but like his father, he was a devout Muslim However, unlike his father, he decided it was rules for thee and not for me. As he would send agents on a regular basis to Timbuktu to extort enormous sums of money from merchants, which is against Islamic law and fucked over his economy because he pushed out a bunch of businesses that made the empire money. He, he sought out essentially a short term solution for money that he thought he needed immediately and fucked over the money that he could have grown. So good job champ. Obviously due to this, he gained a shit ton of enemies, but surprisingly would never be killed. Uh, but he is one that decided to start shit with Morocco because in 1547, after a request from the Moroccan Sultan Muhammad al Arak to seed the salt mines of Tagaza, Ishak the first, sent a group of two, uh, 2,000 mounted men to raid a market town in the Darva Valley of southern Morocco with instructions to avoid killing anyone. So, you know, go to, go to him. He didn't murder anyone. He didn't want to, like, immediately start a war. But this was intended to, as a show of strength, kind of like him saying, hey, Sultan, see all these guys? Fuck around and find out, bitch. Anyways, Asili Shak the first died in the town of Kirkia in 1549 of natural causes despite flipping the bird to Morocco. So that's pretty impressive. He was buried in Kukia as well, and he was succeeded by his brother, Asiya Dawad, or Daoud. However, in 1549, another important figure would emerge from their mother's room, all covered in goo and shit. This was Ahmad al-Mansur, who would become the sixth and most famous ruler of all Saudis. Ahmad was the fifth son of Muhammad ash Sheikh who was the first Saudi Sultan of Morocco. His mother was Laya Masuda after the murder of their father, Mohammed, in 1557. and the following struggle for power, the two brothers, Ahmad al-Mansur and Avid al-Malik, had to flee their elder brother, Abdallah al-Ghalib, and leave Morocco and stay abroad until 1576. The two brothers spent 17 years among the Ottomans between the regency of Algiers and Constantinople, and benefited from Ottoman training and contacts with Ottoman culture. More generally, he received an extensive education in Islamic religious and secular sciences, including theology, law, poetry, grammar, um, lexicography, exegesis, um, exegesis, geometry, arithmetics and algebra, and astronomy. Very well learned guy. So let's back up a bit though before the murder of Al Masur's father in 1556. Um, a different sultan was causing troubles for the Songhai Empire 
the Sultan of Marrakesh had decided his dried leaf chips didn't have enough flavor and decided that he needed to take over the salt mines of Tagaza for all that sweet, juicy salt. And by juicy, it's just, you know, not really juicy. It just enhances flavors. However, he pretty much withdrew immediately afterwards and uh, was a- unable to hold the territory. His battle had come at a great cost to the Sangay people, uh, and it, sh- though as it showed a weakness and a little cost to the empire as well, since they were now bleeding money due to shithead Ishak thinking it was a good idea to bully the fuck out of their main source of income, i.e. the business owners. So, good job again, Ishak. Good job, champ. In 1578, Ahmad's brother, Sultan Abu Maran Abd al-Malik I died in a battle against the Portuguese army at Qasar al-Kabir. Ahmad was named his brother's successor and began his reign amid newly won prestige and wealth from the ransom of Portuguese captives. So he kind of came into power at a really great fucking time because he had a bunch of money. Uh, a lot of prestige was already won for his family and for the rulers that came out of them. And yeah. So soon after his succession, 1578, Sultan Ahmad al-Mansur of Morocco demanded the tax revenues from the Tagaza salt mines. And Asiya Daoud responded by sending a large quantity of gold as a gift. So he kind of gave and he was like, listen, here's some fucking money. Please just leave us alone. But they didn't, they didn't want to leave them alone because uh, Morocco just needs more money. And uh, they decided to keep invading. And so with the invasion of the Morocco ruler, Ahmad al-Mansur, over the dispute of the Tagaza salt mines, the Songhe Empire started to face its gradual decline. The salt and gold mines were the main trading forces led by the Muslim population within the empire. And the fight over who controlled these mines continued between the Sungai Empire and the Moroccans until 1591. But we'll, we'll get there. We are getting there, guys, I promise you. So, besides bullying the fuck out of the Sungai people, Al-Mansur began, <laughs> began his reign by leveraging his dominant position with the vanquished Portuguese during prisoner ransom talks the collection of which filled the Moroccan royal coffers. Shortly after, he commissioned the great architectural symbol of his new birth of, of this new birth of Moroccan power, the El Badi Palace in Marrakesh, a huge and lavish Riyadh-style palace, which he used to receive ambassadors, host celebrations, and most surprisingly, the fanciest BDSM parties ever seen in the world. And little did I know, that the roots of BDSM actually came from the Sadis, who were said to use ropes made of silk and strung their women up bare naked for all to see in their palaces. And Al-Mansur, being enamored by this, decided he needed to be able to string up at least a hundred of his concubines during these parties and do whatever he saw fit with them. Obviously, I'm joking. Uh, He strung up at least 200 concubines. Uh, (laughs) Just joking again. Uh, BDSM... Wasn't that much of a thing back then. And from what I can tell, those type of parties uh, were not openly talked about, at the very least. And I did, I did do some extensive research. I, I tried to find, uh, tried to find where I could actually tie that. Anyways, construction began in December 1578, and uh, it was only finished in 1593 or 1594. And eventually, the coffers began to run dry due to the great expense of supporting the military that they built up to, you know, beat Portugal's ass extensive spy services, and the palace and other urban building projects. A royal lifestyle and a propaganda campaign aimed at the building support for his controversial claim to the caliphate, which is essential leadership equal in terms of, let's say, the Ottoman emperor at this point. So he decided he was just going to take money from other areas in the world and launch some campaigns. But before that, we need to go back to the Songhai Empire and discuss some important events that happened right before Sultan al-Mansur began to conquer pretty much whatever he wanted. In 1582, Asiya Daud had been ruling for 34 years, which, in terms of its other emperors, is a long-ass time. Their people, during this time, experienced stability for the most part, besides the occasional disputes with Morocco, since those were nothing more than skirmishes at the time, um, the Songhai Empire may have never thought of the need to advance their weapon technology due to the stability they experienced. This would in turn lead to their downfall. That and the death of their longtime ruler, Asiya Daud, 
um, either in 1582 or 83, because afterwards it was another power struggle to see who would rule between his children. Since at that point, the remaining children of Siah Muhammad, the first were dead or too old to lead. So the Songhai empire saw a repeat experience of what happened to Siah Muhammad and all of his sons. Since Daud had so many children who were in control of large amounts of territory, it began a bunch of infighting again. (sighs) <sighs> Immediately after his death, two of Eskidao's, uh, Daud's sons fought, and the first victor to claim the throne was Eskidao Muhammad al Hajj, who was able to rule for maybe a year before another one of his brothers started a rebellion, which continued for three years before he was deposed by his siblings in 1586. Then, Muhammad al Hajj brothers decided to elect one of their brothers to be emperor Muhammad Bani as the Asiya. But they soon realized they fucked up because as soon as he came into power, he proved himself to be foolish and cruel by immediately executing two of his brothers who helped him get into power. Just, just imagine fighting in this war between your siblings and then you win with everyone's help. You know, you know, good job, hats off. You're all happy. And then you decide, yeah, you know what? I, I just, I don't want to be emperor. And you vote on one of your other siblings who you think is going to be a good leader. And then they repay that kindness by immediately killing people who helped you overthrow your other asshole brother. That would fucking suck. So Bonnie's brothers then immediately began another civil war, civil war. And they killed Askia, uh, Sia Bani in battle in 1588. But Bani's courtiers, courtiers immediately named Ishak as the new Isia. And so Isia Ishak II would rule, but that was also challenged by people who wanted to place Isia Sadiq in charge. But they were immediately defeated. So now with all of that, let's go back ways and just see how Al-Mansur may have actually caused some of this extra strife that we just saw in this expansion of power um, and his expansion of power and overspending of money for Morocco. So, um, in 1583, after the dispatch of Al-Mansur led by the commander Ab- Abu Abdullah Muhammad bin Baraka and Abu al-Abbas Abbas, Abhad ibn al-Haddad al-Omari, the march of the army began from Marrakesh, and they arrived after 70 days where they initially called for obedience and warning. After the tribal elders refused to comply, the war began, and they were able to annex territories that contained Tuat, Judah, Tamanit, uh, Tamantit, uh, Tab- Tabalbala, or Aurgala, uh, Tsabit, Tekorarin, and others, putting them right on the border to the Songhai Empire as they began to encroach more and more on their territories, putting them right on the border with them as well. Uh, and so during, during the reign of Asiya Muhammad al-Hajj, the one who gets deposed by his brothers, the Saudi Sultan of Morocco, uh, Ahmad al-Mansur, sent an influential merchant as a spy in Gao. While the civil war raged on in 1589, the merchant convinced one of Muhammad Bani's brothers to leave the area and live in Morocco in peace. However, this misguided prince was immediately arrested when he reached to Gaza and was sent to Marrakesh as a prisoner. The Moroccan authorities then forced the prince to write a letter to the sultan asking him to depose Askia Ishak II and take over the empire, giving him an excuse essentially to start a war with the Songhai Empire and fuck him up. Sultan al-Mansur then sent an ultimatum to Sia Ishak II, but was ignored. So Sultan al-Mansur decided now was the perfect time <laughs> to try and raid the Songhai Empire and take full control of the Sultan gold mines, where he foolishly thought he would obtain enough riches to pull himself out of the financial trouble he caused for himself. Little did he know that due to all, all the infighting and because of the raids Morocco had already launched on the salt and gold mines, the Songhai Empire was also pretty fucked financially. So he essentially was like, oh man, these guys got to have more money, right? We keep taking money for them. So let's just go take the rest of the money. 
not realizing he already took pretty much most of their money. So Sultan Al Mansur gathered what troops he could and made sure they were equipped with the latest technology to aid them in their battles, which would prove to be a key factor in the outcome of this campaign. He placed Judar Pasha. And this guy, oh boy, uh, just wait till you get a little of his story. He was a Spaniard who was captured by Muslim slave traders as a young boy and forcibly made into a fucking eunuch. I, so he gets forcibly made into a eunuch. Um, if you don't know what that means, they castrate him. So they, uh, they cut off his dick and balls. Uh, sometimes it's just the balls, but more than likely they cut his dick off too. Anyways, this guy then converts to Islam, um, which is, if that isn't a sign of Stockholm syndrome, I don't know what is because I'm pretty sure if someone cut my dick off and then used me as a slave my entire life, if they ever gave me any sort of power, I'd betray them so fast it would make their goddamn head spin. But maybe he was young enough that he didn't realize how cool his dick could be. And you know, I guess dicks aren't all that cool. Anyways, Judar ended up being a talented commander and began a march with 4,000 men, 2,500 of them being arquebusiers equipped with arquebuses, which were Spanish long rifles that were, fun fact, were the first firearms equipped with a trigger in addition to a stock. So is is a long it's a Spanish long rifle essentially it's really cool. Uh, they also had six cannons and fifteen hundred cavalry and then five hundred infantry equipped with bows, lances, and swords. By the time this happened, though, Askia uh, Sia Isak the second was in a campaign in a far off province against one of his brothers trying to quell that rebellion. When news of the Moroccan invasion reached him, he scrambled to gather allied tribal chiefs, but his messengers were killed along the way, probably again by spies sent by Sultan Al-Mansur. But you know, he went back to Gao and hastily assembled an army, but wasn't able to do so in time to stop the invasion force from capturing the salt mines in Tagaza, virtually unopposed. And due to this, Judah decided he could take the capital pretty easily as well and began the march towards Gao. So with Judar marching towards Gao, we, we now go to the penultimate battle of the Sungai's empire's decline, the Battle of Tondibi. Now, despite the fact that Sia Ishak II had to scramble to build an army, he was actually able to gather a force of around 40,000 men, which is more than 10 times the number of men that Judar was leading. Not only that, but it was their home turf. So they had quite a few advantages, but unfortunately they were bringing swords, bows, and cows to a gunfight. On March 13th, 1591, the two opposing forces would meet. Despite the Sungai still having the advantage with their cavalry, they decided on a plan that honestly sounds like something Charlie Day would come up with in It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. You know, they decided it'd be a good idea to gather up a thousand cows and try to launch them towards the enemy. And as a matter of fact, here's how I imagine the conversation went between the two commanders. Uh, we're going to pretend that one's named Charlie and the other one is named Frank. So we're going to start with Charlie talking. Frank, I figured it out. This plan is gold. Pure gold! Charlie, you want to direct a thousand cows at an army? That's just nuts. No, Frank, it's genius. Hear me out. First off, they won't see it coming. It's, it's just not something you expect, right? Sure, I'll give you that, but no one expects a cow stampede. But Charlie, they have guns. Exactly, Frank. Guns, not cattle prods, not cowboys, not rodeo clowns. Guns. They're not equipped to handle a stampede of a thousand cows. They'll be so shocked and confused, they won't know what hit him. I see where you're going with this. A massive distraction. That's the ticket, Frank. And think about the chaos. There's dust and noise and cows everywhere. They won't be able to see straight, let alone aim their guns and all that confusion. We can do whatever we need to. I move, Charlie. What's our move? 
What if we want, Frank? The world's our oyster when they're dealing with a thousand cows where the kings of chaos rank. And what's more chaotic than a cow stampede? Nothing, Charlie. Absolutely nothing. Or something like that, you know. <laughs> um, sorry for the terrible impressions. I'm not really good at a Danny DeVito or Charlie Day at all. Anyways, uh, they launched the cows, and it went about as well as any other scheme that happens on It's Always Sunny. Because once the cows got halfway to the Moroccans, they opened fire once. And immediately, the cows all turned around and ended up stampeding upon the Songhai Empire. <laughs> I like to imagine that the two guys who came up with this idea uh, for sending the cows to the Moroccans ended up escaping and living somehow. Uh, and then they had this conversation. It starts with Charlie. So maybe we didn't exactly think this whole, uh, think through this whole gun noise thing. Gun noise thing, Charlie. We caused a damn stampede. Well, we were trying to run away from the stampede, Frank. A stampede that we started. All right, yeah, that part's on me. They shot one time, Charlie, once. And the cows turned around and stampeded back. We lost good guys in that chaos. I know, I know, Frank, I know, but I just didn't think that. You didn't think, but that's the problem, Charlie. I just, I thought it'd be a great distraction. Chaos, you know? Oh, it was chaotic, all right, just. Just not the right kind of chaos, and it costs us. I get it, Frank. And then they march. Uh, march away from the thousands of dead bodies that they left behind. <laughs> After the cows stampeded upon the Sungai army, uh, there was enough of their infantry left to chase the Moroccan forces, but as they advanced towards them, they were immediately slaughtered by Moroccan arquebusiers, uh, the ones that were equipped with the guns. They then sent their cavalry in to rout the enemy lines, but Judar was able to maneuver his arquebusiers into place and open fired upon them. And his uh, cannons and the remaining cavalry from this uh, either fled or just ended up being slaughtered. And the only thing left of the Sungai forces were the rear guard. And they, they just were there for hand-to-hand -hand combat, so they pretty much immediately died as well to guns. Essentially, again, they brought... They didn't bring a gun to a gunfight, and they got fucked over for it. So Judar ended up take, taking Gao, uh, but he found out that there really wasn't anything in terms of loot, and went on to just immediately capture Timbuktu and Jene, where much more wealth was found. Much, much more. With the capture of these cities, the once great Songhai Empire had met its end. So that wraps up today's episode. Uh, you know, and from this conflict, from this conflict, I I understand why Morocco attacked. Um, as honestly, in order to keep its defenses up, it would need much more funding for its army that it had amassed to fight off Portugal. I also think it's hilarious that after the first wars of succession with the Asiya Muhammad's children, uh, they didn't learn and implement a better system of succession. Uh, however, they probably just didn't have enough time to do so since the empire's reign was rather short compared to other empires in history. Overall, I did find this to be an interesting topic and loved the dynamics between the rulers and their people. It was also interesting to see how spies were used back then to spread misinformation or just stir shit up. So, you know, just what, what did you guys think about today's episode? What are some of your thoughts and takeaways? Uh, feel free to send them to me at historicalquarrels at gmail.com. And I'll read them out at the end of the next episode, whether it's good or bad. Um, I'll just, I'll, even if it's like three episodes down and you're, you're just now listening to this and you want to send like your own thoughts or something on it. Um, if you have opinions on today's episode, you have feedback, I'll read it out loud too, man. I'll, I'll state out loud an episode and I'll, I'll be like, okay, well, yeah, maybe I could do this better or, you know, you know, I thought about that, but <laughs> 
you know, and I'll talk, I'll talk through, you know, my thinking, uh, but for the most part, like if it's constructive feedback and it's something that I can, you know, realistically do, I'll do it. Um, and I love it as it really does help me understand how I can improve and make this show more entertaining for you and not just rely on numbers that episodes get and be left to try and interpret, interpret that, which, you know, I, I'll still do obviously, but direct feedback is always nice as well. Uh, also my announcement is I have officially completed my schooling and now I have way more free time to write up these episodes and record them as well. I can't promise weekly again, but maybe monthly to bi-monthly. Uh, I do love doing this and just needed more time to be able to put into it. And now I think I have some of that. So you'll get some more in the coming weeks. Thank you again. I, I seriously appreciate you guys listening. I hope that I'm uh, at least somewhat entertaining for you. Uh, please, please let me know how I can improve and I will, I'll do my best to do so. Uh, if you like this episode, please share it with your friends and or family members or enemies if you hated it and spread, spread the love, spread the knowledge. Y'all have a good one. Peace.